Hi and welcome. My name is Anne Markey and today I have a special guest with us today. Uh, her name is Carmen, but instead of telling you about her myself, I'll let her introduce you. Hi, Carmen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, well, my name is Carmen James and I am a virtual, which means online wellness coach, but a little bit about who I am other than my job title. I am a Jesus girl. I am a wife, a mom, a glamma, and obviously an entrepreneur. Awesome. So how many kids do you have? I actually have three. I have uh, two girls and I have a son. They're all grown. And um, my husband from a previous marriage has two children as well. And his children are slightly older than mine. So we have grandchildren. In fact, we are awaiting the arrival of our third grandchild even as we speak. Oh, wow. That must be really exciting. <laughs> Very much so. And I would be remiss if I didn't add that my oldest child, Devin, has a um, golden retriever. Her name is Cannoli, and we treat Cannoli like any of the other grandchildren. She got Christmas gifts. She got a stocking. Um, I am Mimi to, to her, and so Mimi spoils the uh, fur grandbaby rotten. Yeah, well, <laughs> in our family, the grandkids came first and then the grand pets. And I know that my kids take that very seriously. So this summer when we went to go visit my parents, they had like these garden stones that they had all the yes. grandkids paint. And my kids painted one for each of our pets so that they're included in the fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Okay, Carmen. So thanks for letting me know just a little bit more about you. And I think um, that's a lot of fun that you have just a great big family. Um, and I want to just shift our conversation a little bit more towards faith. So before we kind of talk about, um, I know we had discussed you talking about your cancer journey. Um, but before we get to that, maybe just give us a little bit short snippet about your testimony. Absolutely. I was born and raised. Um, <laughs> I was born and raised, I like to say, in the Nazarene church. I grew up in a very strict home. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, my dad was very big into our church, very much lived out his faith, Was a, has been uh, a tremendous role model for me through the years. But like a lot of kids, um, I didn't grow up necessarily loving church. I might have been, especially as a teenager, the one who was like, oh, do we have to go to church? I got to get in the car again. Because my dad really was of the mentality, if the church doors are open, we will be there. Get your butt in the back seat. Let's go. No questions asked. Don't argue. So um, when I went off to college and was obviously out on my own, um, you know, at that age, you, you're just exploring the world, right? You're out from underneath your parents' roof and their rules. And my rules at that point didn't include church. And I really started to drift, to be honest. And church was not a priority. Relationship with God was not a priority. I wasn't in the word of God. I mean, I could give lip service you know, because I'd had years of going to church, but going to church is not the same thing as being in real relationship with the Lord. And so uh, I got into um, young adulthood and uh, married and he was Catholic. I made that that uh, conversion to Catholicism, did that for about 10 years, learned a lot, but it just wasn't for me. Uh, after our divorce, I continued in the Catholic Church for a very short time, and my second husband's uh, father was, well, shall we say, an, an atheist, and so that presented a lot of challenges in, um, in our marriage and in how I wanted to raise the kids, and I often found myself going to church alone and trying to take three small kids by myself. And it was a real struggle. And I, I gave up, I gave in. And um, that marriage ended 10 years later. And so at that point, 
uh, I was in a space where I felt like I need to get back to church. And so I went back to more of a Protestant religion like I was raised. And so I went to the Baptist church and fell in love and started taking my children because I wanted my children to have that that base. Right. Yeah. Um, the person who I'm married to now uh, was not going to church at that time. And I just didn't let that that deter me. But what I found over the years was it it did start to impact me. You know, we're told in the Bible, be very careful about, you know, being unequally yoked. And and I truly believe even as I coach as a wellness coach, I tell people we become most like the five people that we spend the most time with. And um, that impacted me. And, and I found myself again, once again, drifting away from church. So long story short, uh, five, five and a half years ago, I was um, diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma stage three, which is a blood cancer. For those of you who know nothing about that disease, that illness, that type of cancer, you hear the words incurable when you sit with that oncologist. And that dropped me to my knees. It was a big wake up call because God had been pursuing me, Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit had been pursuing me and uh, the bells and whistles were going off on the dashboard of life. I was just choosing to ignore and live my life the way I wanted to live on my terms. And that diagnosis brought everything to a screeching halt. It literally, my world crashed. It was turned upside down. And in that moment, I'll be honest, I realized that I was not in control and mm -hmm. that someone else was calling the shots for real and had delivered me something to which I wouldn't be able to figure a way out because I'm a, a, a firstborn A-type personality, very driven, a control freak, if you will, up to that point. And this diagnosis would be the one that I would find myself on my knees begging the good Lord. And um, that is the testimony that that I have continued to share, even with my clients. If I can change one life, if I can spare one person that heartache, if I can be the wake up call that someone identifies with and goes, that's me, I'm the one living life on my terms. And to be quite honest, when I say my terms, it was a lot of stress. I was a workaholic. I had put work first, hmm. family second, and God third. And those are not God's priorities. I was living completely out of alignment and trying to chase success on the world's stage and on the world's terms. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. I love hearing testimonies of how, you know, even as a kid, you got to know the Lord and that wasn't wasted right? No. Like, mm -hmm. yes, you drifted maybe a little bit, but because of that base that you had, you went back to it. And I know that as a mom with younger kids, like my oldest is 13, I always worry about, you know, are we teaching them the right things? But it's just an encouragement to remember that, you know, that education or that training or that environment, even if they make wrong choices at, you know, 18 to 35, it's not wasted. God can still redeem it and can still use it and can still, you know, bring them back. Um, and so that's kind of what I was thinking about when you were sharing your testimony. So thank you for that encouragement. And I'm, yeah, I'm sorry that it took cancer to kind of wake you up. Um, sure. But I'm sure and that's kind of what we'll kind of talk a little bit more about, about, you know, how scripture can be so practical, certainly in these really hard situations that we face. Um, and I know that sometimes, certainly when people get that diagnosis, I feel like people can either go two ways. One, it brings them to their knees, right? Or yeah, two, absolutely. it makes them think there can't be a God, this isn't good kind of thing, right? And absolutely. so I'm happy to hear that the Lord used it. Um, and so tell us a little bit more. So let's, um, yeah, share your cancer story a little bit with us and just tell us about you know, how you found the Lord in that and how he encouraged you through that season. 
Absolutely. Well, the interesting thing behind this is my dad was diagnosed with the same cancer 12 years prior. And so I watched my dad walk in faith, never wavered, uh, really took a hard line position that he was going to do the aggressive chemo route and that he was going to stand in faith and believe for his healing, believe for his miracle. He was not willing to claim the word incurable because my dad was like, you know, the Lord is the great physician. And if he wants to heal me, he will. And if he doesn't heal me here, he will heal me on the other side. So, you yeah. know, dad really, it, you know, it rocked our world uh, when we got the news that dad was sick. And we were a lot, you know, much like we were when we found out that that I had it. Uh, you're just shocked, and you you start to go, "How did we get here? And how did we? Were there signs that we missed along the way?" And um, Dad, we were. I remember at one point just sobbing. You know, I was heartbroken and scared that yeah. I would lose my dad. And yeah. he said, "Carmen, I'm going to tell you something right now." don't cry. Don't waste your tears. I'm good. Like my, my eternity is secure and I'm good. If the good Lord, dad says it just like this. If the good Lord calls me home today, I'm good. Waste no yeah. tears. I've lived a great life. Do I want to go in this moment? No, but yeah. it's up to God and we have no control. So I will do my part and, and I will do the treatment, but if the answer is still no, and he takes me home, we're good. We're at peace. And I remember in the moment thinking, wow, no, I'm not at peace and I'm not good with this. And, uh, you know, and I, I sort of was that individual in that moment that was like, why would my God do this to my dad? I mean, my dad was so active in his church and volunteered and would get the shirt off his back and oftentimes did to people. I mean, he was always the first one to jump up and volunteer. He would literally, when the church was raising money for a project, my dad would stand up out of his pew and, and commit thousands of dollars. And I would look at my mom and she would have this like look of horror on her face because she was like, we don't have that money. Like, we, we, I don't know where that's coming from. But that was, a, that was I learned faith yeah. in action. And mm. I'm thankful for that because as I walked out that journey with dad, little did I know 12 years later, that was going to be me. Yeah. And, and I find God. one of the things I find is, um, you know, with your dad's journey, just his testimony of faith and through that, that's amazing. But also, that the Lord used that to prepare you probably, right? In that he would probably, I mean, I don't know if he's still around, but would say, yeah, if if my journey could give you a good foundation to help you in yours, and it was also worth it. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that is, he is still here. And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you something really interesting. So 12 years prior, my dad is diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He beats it. Uh, wow. goes into what they, you know, say is, is remission. Um, 12 years later, I get, I get the call. You, you have stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I'm like, wow. So I, I underwent the same aggressive, uh, chemotherapy that my dad did. I lost all my hair. I was wow. deathly ill. Um, I was, I'm at that time, an entrepreneur trying to run a book of business. So I have no guaranteed paycheck. None of that. I need to work. I have to work. And I was scared, uh, scared to death um, would be an understatement. But I also recognized in that moment exactly what you just said, that God had already prepped the stage. And yeah. I already had a great example of faith. Now, did that great example make it super easy for me to go through that process? 100% no. Um, in fact, I, I think like anybody had to work through the stages of grief. I yeah. had to take, take my own journey in it and let it play out. And I remember in the first 24 to 48 hours of reality really sinking in for me, I remember it was on a Friday night sitting at the kitchen table. My husband came home from work. I'm sitting there 
bawling and my husband like is like what's going on and i'm like i am just so angry at god right now i can't even tell you like i am so yeah. angry look what happened to my dad and now it's happening to me and this isn't fair and why me and you know the whole what did i do to deserve this and yeah. and just this anger that and, and just it spewed out at me and i i remember who i needed to get that out i needed to work yeah. through that and process all of that if i was going to move forward and i allowed myself as i know god did that time to just begin to let the dust settle and i didn't linger there i would say within mm. a day or two i was out of that pit and i was like gonna rise up and kick cancer to the door but yeah. what i will say is there were moments in the six months of chemo and being very sick and trying to hold on to my business that i wouldn't say i got that bitter I, I i wouldn't say after that moment in time i never ever blamed god but there were moments when i was certainly like i don't see how any good can come from this here's yeah. what i know today five and a half years later number one the exact day that I came out of remission, I received a phone call that my dad would battle cancer again. Oh, wow. And that was, I was literally in this kitchen. I could not believe what I was hearing. Yeah. And um, that was hard. That was hard. But, yeah. but I was, I was like, oh my gosh, we just, it just feels like we came up for air and we're yeah. going to get drug under yet again. Praise yeah. God, he would come through for my dad yet again. My dad is still here, he's in his 80s. He has now beat cancer twice. Wow. And um, what I have come to realize is two of the clients in my virtual wellness coaching program called Fit Souls, two of those clients have, have found out that they have cancer as they've been a part of my program. Wow. And I have one right now who's about to battle breast cancer for the second time. We just received that news last week. I've been in a lot of communication with her um, inside my wellness program. Just so you know, one of the pillars of my program is the spiritual faith based component. I would yeah. have never done that. I would have never done that prior to this cancer journey, I don't think but it became so important to me. And uh, we have Bible study on Monday nights over Zoom. And this particular client has been very active in my Bible study. She nearly lost her husband last year. She's been through so much. So we as a tribe, we call ourselves a tribe. We're devastated by the news, but here's what I, I shared with her over the weekend. We are not going into this battle, this cancer battle. When I say we, I mean we. I'm I'm yeah. right there with her in this as her coach. We're not going into battle asking for the victory. We are going into battle proclaiming the victory. Yeah. I, and I, I, believe love that. That. I believe that. Yeah. And I think you touched on quite a lot of things. And I one of the things I really appreciate, and this is kind of what I find interesting is. I mean, the Bible tells us, you know, when Lot lost everything, he has these extreme emotions. And so we see it in scripture, right? Yeah, yeah, but then yeah. when it comes to our own personal journey and we have these feelings of like anger and, you know, those feelings of being like unfair, I find that most Christians get really uncomfortable with those feelings because right. it's kind of this like, you're not allowed to be angry with God kind of thing. Um, and I've always felt like you, like, no, like he, okay, be angry, but go to God with that anger, like Absolutely. express it, get it out on the table, tell him, but do it in him. And so I love that you shared that, that, you know, just because you did have that foundation of faith and just because you had that faith example, it doesn't make the journey that much easier, but it's this kind of freedom to just have that relationship, be upset and then, you know, stew in it for a little bit and then move forward with it. And so, um, yeah, I always love when people are happy to share, like, sometimes it's messy, like our feelings and our faith kind of 
aren't always linear, you know, and kind of get muddied up. Um, but I love that you were able to move out of that into a space where, you know, you were trusting God through the process. Um, and then being able to use that experience to then encourage others. Absolutely. Because here's the deal, you know, the biggest thing is we, I had, I, I just said this to this client, God trusts us with the story, right? Mm -hmm. He can't trust everyone with an incurable cancer. He can't trust everyone with breast cancer for the second time, but he's entrusted us because he knows that we will use that story and we he will use it for our good and his glory if we allow it. And I have been very open, very vulnerable, very raw, very real with my clients about this entire journey, very transparent. You know, one of the Bible verses that um, early on in my cancer journey really stuck out for me is from the book of Esther. And that the verse about perhaps, perhaps you were created for such a time as this. And in the moment, I remember thinking, well, that really sucks. <laughs> you mean to tell me that's what this is all going to boil down to, that I was created for this? I mean, what good is going to come from this? What I can tell you is and what I'm so passionate about is that I God has made it very real, the calling on my life and who and what is my mission field. And these women that I get to do life with and I get to be their wellness coach, that's my assigned mission field. And I have watched God move inside my clients' lives. I have watched God show up. I, When COVID hit, I was in a gym as a personal trainer. So basically all I did was give people great workouts when COVID hit, I had a choice in that moment. I prayed about it and I was had a certification as a wellness coach, but I had not used that certification. God opened the door during COVID for me to still be able to have an income, to still be able to have a job because I could move my clients online, turn my business upside down and go from just personal training to giving my clients workout, um, faith-based spiritual component, a nutrition component, a stress management component. We talk about sleep. We talk about uh, work-life balance, which is where I found myself when I had the, the cancer diagnosis was I wasn't living in alignment with God's priorities and there was no work-life balance. It was all about work. There was no God. And so I live it out in real time. And my clients, every time I go back to the oncologist, which is every six months to have a blood draw to see where I'm at, my clients get to see me walk that out in real time. And it's one thing to sing a song about faith. You know, I'm always reminded of that song, Oceans. That was such a popular song at the time I was diagnosed with cancer. I know that song because I would sing it and sob. That was my, my victory song, if you will, because I felt like God was taking me into the deep where my feet wouldn't touch on purpose so that I would become so dependent on him. And when we're never called to the deep, we don't know the definition of faith. We can sing about it till the cows come home. But when your, faith, when your feet don't touch the bottom of that ocean and you have to lean on him and not yourself, that is the game changer. Totally. And I, I completely agree. And this is not, I'm not going to go into my story at all because I really want to focus on yours. But I found the same thing that, you know, like I grew up in a Christian home and I thought I had faith, you know. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> I mean, it's when you face those hard things where it's like, no, this is the rubber hitting the road. And this is when you have to decide, like, is this real? And I remember for myself, it's like, um, I could spend all my time angry or frustrated or questioning or anything like that. But if I really believe that God is who he says he is, amen, then I have to choose to trust, right? And so it's always these points where it's like, you have that choice, right? You have the choice to say, no, I don't know what he's doing, but I trust him. 
or it's really like, this is a whole bunch of baloney. But I know that for myself, it's like, it's in those hard moments where you see him so much stronger that builds your faith, which I mean, it's always unfortunate. Like, why is it the hard things that help us grow? <laughs> you right. know, it's like, I don't actually want to go through all those things. Um, but then on the other side, it's seeing like, wow, the Lord carried me through. He helped me grow. I understand so much more. And so there are these benefits, even though it's, you know, sometimes I like to say a circus or a gong show or just a lot of ridiculousness. Sure. <laughs> Well, if we're, if, if we're not entrusted with the story and we don't live it out, how will others really even know he exists? Because if we can just be cured by, you know, modern medicine, which I know God uses medicine, absolutely. But where I'm going with this is if we can just do it without him, then no one's ever going to believe that he exists or that he is sovereign and that he is in control and he has the bigger picture. It, we're again, we are, I, I tell my clients all the time, we are the miracles. You know, when people say to me, I've never seen a miracle. I'm like, you're looking at one. You're looking yeah. at one. You know, when you hear those words incurable, when you, I was told at the start of my journey, Hey, look, you can do this cancer. It might work. It might not work. You could die in the process. You could get clear through chemo and still have cancer, still have that massive tumor. And there won't be anything we can do because we can't do surgery, remove. Here's where I got hung up is I was like, well, why can't you just go in and take the tumor out? And they're like, uh, you, you're missing the point. A blood cancer means we could take the tumor out. Oh, yeah, we could do it. But it's in your blood. Do you yeah. want, you know, if we drain all your blood out, you die. And, and, and that was really hard for me to get my head around that, you, you know, and, and I kept thinking to myself, well, why couldn't it have been thyroid cancer? I mean, thyroid cancer is one of the most curable cancers if you get it early enough. Why'd it have to be this? Here's what I know five and a half years later. <laughs> God knew that his strong-willed child needed something that, you know, it's like in the Bible, wasn't it Paul who had the thorn in the flesh and he kept going back and, you know, remove this, please remove this, please take it. And God's like, no, I'm not taking that away. Why? Because it creates, I will forever be dependent on him now. There is no being that you know, one sheep like I was that wanders off and the good shepherd has to keep going after the sheep. He's like, nah, uh -uh, I got this. We'll deliver the incurable. We'll see what she does with that. And it really is a sink or swim moment. And yeah. I will say the enemy, the enemy has, I've learned a lot about mindset. I've learned a lot about the battlefield of the mind. Uh, because that's where the battle is won or lost in most things in life. And the enemy very early on, when I was not rooted and grounded in the word of God, when I did not know my identity in Christ, when I did not understand love, not your life, even unto death, you know, I was like, I, I would listen to that and be like, Okay, like exactly what does that mean again? And now I know exactly what it means. You yeah. know, I'm not here yeah. for me. I'm not here to just get married and have kids and be a glamour and run a business and make, you know, money and go on vacation. I'm here to serve him. He's not here to serve me. Amen. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's what it is. And I, I love how practical scripture can be and how it becomes so real in certain Ooh. circumstances, right? That's like right. In, when I was younger, I would read scripture and I'd be like, what do you mean? Like, this makes no sense. Like, how is this possible? And then you go through an experience. It's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have asked this question because now I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I surely know what <laughs> love, not your life unto death means. Yeah. yeah. And so um, one of the things I really love doing is, you know, because we always hear Christians, okay, like read your Bible, pray, we know it's important, you know. Um, so I like making it really practical. Like we know that the word of God can really just like come in and give us life. Um, and so I know you shared a verse um, that was really helpful, but, you know, like how did scripture help you in your journey? Absolutely. 
Well, I, I've shared this story before um, on a couple of other podcasts. At the time that I was diagnosed with cancer, as I alluded prior to COVID, I was in a gym and the gentleman who owned the gym that I was um, renting space from, uh, he's a Christian. He's now an associate pastor at a local church. Um, he sold the gym, but at the time he was the, the, the owner and there were mornings that I would show up to the gym and, and I had to wear a wig and that, you know, for a female, I, I think losing your hair is one of the most devastating things ever. Um, and I had a wig and, um, he knew about it. I mean, he was so supportive. And I remember one morning walking in the gym and I just, I was sick that morning. I didn't feel like I looked good. I probably didn't even have my wig on straight. And he met me at the door and put his arm around me. And he spoke scripture over me and he prayed over me. And he did that more than once. Mm -hmm. And I was so thankful that God put him there. Um, it was a game changer for me. It he was the reason I started going back to church. He was the reason that I got back in my Bible, that I really got back in relationship with the Lord um, mm -hmm. because he ministered to me every day. And wow. he believed in me and he spoke life over me when others were not. You know, mm -hmm. when you hear incurable and people aren't educated, sometimes they say things that are they mean well but they're devastating right yeah um, and he was that one person mm. that just would speak the word of god pray the word of god and yeah. stand in the gap and and it was amazing and i'm thankful for that because that was life-giving life-changing that was god god put that person right there when i needed them mm. the most and i really have prayed that God would give me those same opportunities to pay that forward for others, to be the one who speaks life, stands in the gap, intercedes, and walks out the difficult. Wow. Yeah, I love that, that, you know, God does put the right people in the right places for us and encourages us. And I love that he just spoke scripture over you. And, you know, we read about, you know, and the peace of God will wash over you. And sure. that was kind of going through my mind when you were saying that, that it doesn't even necessarily need to be a specific scripture, just the opening of God's word and yes. the speaking it out loud and speaking yes. it over people can bring people peace. Because I think sometimes um, people are like, okay, I want to do this, but what scripture? And you can get hung up on, oh what God. do I say? What do I do? Instead of just being, you know what, I'm just going to speak whatever words, whatever scripture the Lord tells me to, and let yeah. him bring the peace, you know? Yes, 100%. I, it's funny you said that. I remember I was that person early on mm -hmm. who I Googled healing scriptures mm -hmm. and I'm obsessed. I printed them all off. I started putting them on index cards. I started trying to memorize them because... That was me trying to take control. That was me trying to, well, there must be this magic formula that if I pray the right words or I memorize enough scripture that God's, you know, he's going to love me enough that he's going to come through. It was never about that. It was never about that, you know? And the other thing that I've really learned since then is we don't have to pray some big, laborious, perfect prayer when it comes to healing, because it isn't about that. It, you know, it isn't about that. I truly believe it's number one about, do we believe, do we have the faith? Do we understand our identity in Christ and who God is and what he's capable of? But then also recognizing there are no perfect words and it doesn't matter how much we memorize or we could drone on in prayer for 20 minutes if, if there's healing, it's because God ordains it. God gets the glory. God does the healing. It isn't because 10 people, you know, necessarily laid hands on you and prayed over you, even though we realize, 
you know, the Bible talks about that. I'm not negating that. I'm simply saying sometimes I think we get hung up and, you know, someone will say, well, will you pray for me? And we're like, oh, I don't know. I mean, what if I don't say the right words or they don't get healed or I don't have the magic scripture. I don't know what scripture to give you. It isn't that. And at the end of the day, God knows our heart, right? He knows our yeah. heart. I love that because you're right. And I, I'm like you, I, I want the formula. I want, Lord, just tell me what specific steps do I need to take so that my kids get saved? Lord, tell me the specific steps I need so that I don't face another trial. <laughs> and it's like, unfortunately, it's taken a lot of hard things to say, no, you can have the most amount of faith and say all the right things and do all the right things. And the Lord still choose not to intervene or, right. you know, and so I remember this instant in the last year at our church within the span of one week, two different girls got diagnosed with the same cancer. Wow. And they were both the church gathered around both and poured the oil and prayed and laid hands on them both. And one was healed miraculously like th they went to their next appointment and it was gone and the next walked through the cancer journey you know whoa. whoa yeah and and it's like well why why which like why this one and not this one and i know right. the mom must have been thinking the same thing and it was kind of hard to watch in a sense because it's like what right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. But just that it like we did all the same things and the results were very different. But you know, they they both walked the boat that the Lord had put in front of them, and both of them gave the glory to God. And so thankfully the second one is now in remission. Um, but yeah, I just found it was just this really weird moment where it's like, wow, the same, like same age almost same week, same diagnosis, same, same, you know, yeah, it was crazy. And so I really love that. It's like, yeah, no, it's not about what we do and what we say it really is about the Lord. And it doesn't take a magic verse. Um, it's just trusting the Lord for his plan, even if we don't know what that is or agree with it. A hundred percent, you know, and I'm the thing that I, as you were telling that story, yeah, it had been, it been, it would be very difficult to watch, but having gone through it, what I know to be true is he's working something out in and through that individual who went through that journey. Right. And that yep. person's got a different story to tell than her sister. And God's going to use that differently. He's going to use both of them, but very, very differently. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited that, I mean, I'm sure the journey was hard and long. How long were you in um, like your treatment? Treatments, yeah. Yeah, six months of treatment. Yeah. And um, they, uh, the, the oncologist said, we're going to do something called RCHOP. And for anybody who's been through cancer, you know, our chop is literally the most aggressive cancer protocol out on the market today. Um, and it's, it, you know, it, it knocks you. It, I mean, I was, I, I would literally get home from, you know, four or five hours uh, getting chemo from the hospital and I would spend the next 24 hours literally beside the toilet on the bathroom floor, face down, like help me survive, like just get me through the next 24 hours. It was debilitating. I'm sure. And then in those moments, were you praying or reading or was it just like focused on getting better? Like what was your mind state? Great question. I did pray a lot. Um, I, I, I did have, this is a, something I don't share with, I guess, very many people, but um, when they put my chemo port in and I took my first round of chemo, they hospitalized me for a few days. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember the nurse coming in and saying, I know you're sick, but you are required to get up and walk the hall, uh, uh, the hall of uh, this hospital, because 
we need you to. We can't let you lie in bed. So either you get up with your IV pole and you go out and walk for 30 minutes, or I have to give you uh, shots in your stomach. And I, well, I'm petrified of needles. So that was the other thing. God and I had a real conversation about that. <laughs> because I'm like, wait a minute, you got the wrong girl. You forgot. You you get, I, I, you get know I'm scared crapless of needles. So why would you choose me for this project? Uh, so of course, the minute she said needles, I'm like, I, I don't care if I barf all over the hallway. I'm up. I remember going out into the hallway. I was the only one up that night walking. And as I made the corner of the hallway, I could see I was pretty high up in this hospital. I could see out the sun was setting. And Ooh. I remember <laughs> I rounded that corner with that IV pole. And in the blink of an eye, I saw that sun setting and I felt the Lord put his arm around me. And I knew in that minute he was walking that hall with me. Hmm. Amen. His presence was so real. Yeah. It, I mean, I got mentally, it was like, I just knew he was right there beside me and we, we would get through it one way or the other. We were going to get through this. I mean, I didn't know if the, if, if the chemo would work, yeah. but I knew he was there. I absolutely knew he was present. Wow. That's crazy. That's amazing. And I, and I think that's, you know, people may ask like, well, how do you know it's him and how do you hear him? But it's like, no, when you spend time with him and he shows up, like you do, you, there's no other answer. It, you know exactly who it is and that he's right there with you. And, um, that's so encouraging to hear. Um, yeah. <laughs> <It's a lot. laughs> yeah. Um, so you've told, I mean, I know you've mentioned your program a little bit and just to yeah. kind of like wrap things up, sure. um, do you have like, uh, tell me where we can find you online and if there's like a freebie you can offer or more yeah. about how people can connect with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So um, I have been in the health and fitness industry for 38 years as I alluded to earlier, I started out in group fitness, personal training. I did some, I got certified as a personal chef. So I, I did uh, home delivery meal services where I cooked meals for a while. Um, then I went on to get my certification as a, a wellness coach, which means I look at people holistically, the total package all the parts and pieces that make you up as an individual, what makes up your lifestyle, what is missing. And I created by the grace of God, what I call the programs called fit souls, S O U L S. It is an eight pillar program. It, it includes workouts. Uh, we address water, uh, how we fuel our bodies instead of feeding our emotions, our, the quality of our sleep, stress management, work-life, home-life balance, mindset, that battlefield of the mind. And then the eighth and final pillar is the spiritual faith-based component because I want to co-labor with the Lord in my business. And um, my clients work with me online. Everything is housed through my uh, private Facebook group, Fit Souls. I do have a, a website. It is Carmen James fitness.com. And on the website, uh, there are testimonials, I have free resources, there's a link where if you're interested, um, you can fill out a form, it's a prospective client questionnaire, it commits you to nothing, but allows me to learn a little bit about what your goals are to creating a healthier lifestyle. That is the calling I believe God has on my, my life. I believe God created all of us to live healthy and happy. I don't think he really wants any of his children to be sick ever. Yeah. I, I don't think he's an evil God by any stretch of the imagination. I think that's a byproduct of the broken world that we live in. Yeah. But that being said, I am on mission to work with women who some want to lose weight, others don't. It isn't just about weight loss. It's about 
being healthy, being happy. Right. What does that look like for you? How do you define that? Um, what do you need? What are the tools? What are the resources? What help do you need? What are your goals? And ultimately, I've created, I have my fit souls, my paid group, but I also have a free group on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you can find me at um, Dare to be Healthy and Happy is the name of the free Facebook group, Dare to be Healthy and Happy, because I believe that's what God wants. He wants us to be healthy and happy. And I really encourage people either go to the website, fill out the form, and let's have a free 30-minute consultation, see if what I offer is a good fit, or join Dare to be Healthy and Happy. Start there, because at the end of the day, we... We want to do, I guess, business with people we know, like, and trust. And maybe through that, this podcast, you've got a good feel for my personality and my background. And maybe you're like, hey, I think I might like to hang out with her. Sometimes, though, people need more time to figure yeah. that out. So the, the free Facebook group is awesome. And then I'm on Instagram at Carmen James Fitness. And um, I just really am all about winning souls for the kingdom. Mm. But I, that's not the frontal push. I, I kind of weave that in. My clients know that. I, I don't hide the fact. I tell them straight up, look, I'm a Jesus girl. And I don't hide that. I don't, I'm not ashamed of that. I co-labor with the Lord. Um, and I just want to change lives for whatever time he uh, has left for me here on earth, I want to do as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. I'll make sure to add those links in the show notes so people can find you easily. Thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity.